This week's sponsors are Devil's Cove Tattoo. Go see me mate John at Devil's Cove Tattoo Studio. Tattoos for Scousers from Scousers. You'll find all their links within the description. Give them a follow. Thanks. Hello everybody and welcome to the Billy Moore Podcast and today's special guest is Mark Epi, the Beast Epstein. How are you mate? I'm alright, nice to meet you. Nice, nice to meet you too. Get yourself into that mic, my mate. Cool. Uh, so tell us a little bit about yourself, Mark. Um, well, um, I mean I'm an ex-cage um, fighter who's now kind of a stuntman, uh, which I, I love both of the both of them uh, professions. This is your first podcast, isn't it? It is. I'm very nervous. <laughs> I could tell. I could see. Because you're a different person behind the camera than you are from me. So, don't worry about it, mate. Just take your time. Take a deep breath. Remember to speak into the mic. Tell us your story. I spoke to you last night. Um, and you've got one hell of a story, which is quite powerful. You know, from growing up in the care system, to the, the the abuse you suffered, you went through a lot of trauma, rejection, abandonment. No, you've been through a lot of struggles, mate. And um, I think you've got a powerful message to carry to, to 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 people out there, youngsters. And you said that to me last night. So tell us a little bit about growing up, what it was like for you. Well, um, you know, I was born in '68 in Sydenham somewhere, and um, we moved to New Cross, maybe a year or two later in uh, Clifton Rides and um, went to Jill Derrick's school. My mum uh, had um, five kids, but at the time when I was going to school at Jill Derrick, in, uh, when I lived at Clifton Rides, it was just me and my two older sisters. I did have an older brother, he was adopted because uh, he had kidney problems. So Michael was adopted through the Dr. Bernardo's um, home. And I never really seen Michael until much later in my life. Um, but we'll get to that. Um, yeah, so there was me and my two sisters. Um, my father was um, not really there at all. Uh, so it was just my mum and my two sisters until my brother George was born from the same, same dad as me. Um, but when George was born, I got my first um, taste of being in care. We were fostered, me and my sister, Angie. Um, we were fostered in Folkestone. I was about three. And um, we were taken there by our social worker. And we, we, when the social worker left, we were separated, me and my sister. She was maybe a couple, she's two, three years older than me. Was you close to your sister? Yeah. I was clo I'm still close to to my sister. Um, not not all my brothers and sisters, but to, to that in particular sister Angie, Angela. Yeah, I'm very close with her. And uh, we were put, we were separated. And when the social worker left, we were separated and put into uh, separate bedrooms. And I remember I didn't know what was going on. Didn't have a clue. And uh, I remember you know crying myself to sleep. Call, screaming for my mum because um, I didn't have a clue really what was going on right while we'd been taken away we was in we was fostered in Folkestone the first time I don't know for a few months and then we went home went back to school chill Derek at Clifton Rise and then a couple of years later my brother David was born and the same thing happened again we went into care yeah, we went into care, me and Angie, and uh, this time I think we was in Catford or maybe Dartford. I'm not really sure. There was a f there was quite a few. So um, yeah, we went to we went to another home, uh, another foster home when David was born, and then we came home again, 
uh, my mum wasn't with my father, but she was seeing him on and off, and she was also seeing someone else on and off. And I think my dad found out, and they were fighting. They used to fight a bit. I mean, it seems like a lot of the relationships my mum had, there was violence involved. There was fighting, and I remember I actually tried stabbing my dad in the back with a fork. <laughs> He was on top of my mum, I was about four, maybe five. And uh, I remember going to the kitchen drawer and getting the fork. He was lucky it wasn't a knife, because I would have proper, I would have stuck it in him. He was on top of my mum, giving her a hiding over something. I don't know whether she was cheating on him or, it, you know, he, he had a separate family. He had another family around the corner. He left three kids in Jamaica, came to England, had another three with my mum. And he also had another three with an, another black woman round the corner. So, I, I mean, I ended up going to school with my stepbrothers and sisters when we uh, we moved from New Cross and we moved to Broccoli. I ended up going to school. I, we, I used to go to a school called John Stainer. And uh, I ended up being in school with my stepbrothers and sisters. But um, he would come round. He, he used to come round on a Sunday and... Uh, he taught, he'd comb my hair, taught me to tie my shoelaces. That's the only thing he ever taught me was to tie my shoelaces. And uh, he'd give me a five pound note. And then when he left, I'd give the five pound note to my mum. And I was, you know, back in the early seventies, a fiver was, you know, maybe equivalent of 50 quid nowadays. Um, so yeah, he'd give me the fiver and I'd give it to my mum. And that was uh, the shopping and, uh, you know, us three boys for the week type thing. Uh, then my mum met someone else and she married him and we moved to Broccoli and they were fighting, they used to fight and I used to, uh, you know, I wasn't sure because I was about five, six, seven, somewhere around that age and uh, they were always fighting and I don't know if she was cheating on him or if he, he was cheating on her or if he was jealous or what it was about but they was fighting a lot and I, I, I started to hate this guy. And, uh, you know, he started giving me some anger issues until one day, because I mean, bef at the end of this relationship, my mum married this guy, it maybe it lasted about a year, but at the end of the relationship, we the whole family was in one bedroom in the house. We was, we was like terrorized by this guy. So we uh, we all stayed in one bedroom for a, a, maybe a week or 10 days. And then we left. My mum took all the kids and we left and we were homeless. And we ended up going to uh, Carrotton House, which was a DOS house back, in the, back in, the, in the day, you know, for winos and shit like that. So my mum contacted uh, the social services again. And this time they said to her, look, we'll take the kids. You get, we, you sort yourself out. We'll take the kids off for you. And, uh, you know, we, we'll take care of them. So I was placed in, I think me and my sister Angie went into a foster home on the Isle of Sheppey. This was 1976. And uh, we were on Isle of Sheppey. Because I remember it's 76, I mean, it was a beautiful summer. It was one of the hottest summers on record. And uh, yeah, me and Angie was down by the coast. It was lovely, you know, and I made, made a few good friends and I've got some, some good memories, most of them good memories from uh, that foster home. Uh, we, we was in Minster on the Isle of Sheppey. And um, yeah, we came home from, no, we didn't come home from the Isle of Sheppey. Um, I went into a, a home on Brown Hill Road in Catford I was there for a little while, but I started I started being really rebellious and naughty and I was doing burglaries at eight. I was, you know, breaking into things with, like we broke into a laundriette, me and this guy, this older guy, this older kid who was in the home with me. We should have been going to school. We, we hopped school for the day and uh, broke into this laundriette and we got nicked. And uh, the police took me back to the home and they nicked uh, Alan, his name was, and uh, like he was about 11, 12. And uh, yeah, so I started getting a bit, you know, naughty and hopping school all the time and 
doing think burglaries and shit like that and uh, smoking and you know um so I started getting a bit too much. I would, they wasn't going to put me in another foster home. They decided they weren't going to put me in a foster home. They wanted to put me in a boarding school. So at the age of nine, 1977, November 1977, I went to my boarding school, Hill House. At the age of nine? Yeah, at the age of yeah. nine. I was the youngest kid in the school when I got there. And uh, I ended up staying in the school for six years until I eventually came home. But while I was at Hill House, um, I, I, developed a, I developed a relationship with this female teacher, and you know, it was first of all, it was like it was like mother. It, she was like my surrogate mother, and then it became she became a bit more than my surrogate mother. We started holding hands under the under the table, and and how old was you then, Mark? I was. Ten. Ten, and she was old. She was holding your hands under the. Yeah, under the I was wow. holding hands with her under the. And table. how old was this woman? She was twenty six, twenty seven. She was married. She was married to the deputy headmaster's son. Um. Pretty insane, really. Anyway, our our relationship because I was um, like when you when you got to the school, you was placed in a dormitory. It was six man dormitory. It was a bit like junior prison, really. Was, there was there was wooden bars on the windows, um, so you couldn't, you know, you had to break the pull the bar, the, the wooden bars off to get out the window. Um, and I was in dormitory two, and then there was about eight dormitories, and but each dormitory had a teacher that was a dorm mentor, and my dorm mentor was. Uh, was my t was my teacher? I mean, I want to say her name, but I, d I mean, I don't. I don't know. I'm just, I just find this a bit awkward to even talk about. It will be, will be, won't it? Yeah, I mean, especially you know, it's, it's like a lot of people will end up seeing this eventually, I suppose. But um, yeah, it. You know, she started grooming me, and uh, eventually. You know, she was asking. She she wanted to see. Well, she she asked to see me, see me kind of semi naked, and she wanted to see. You know, what I was what I was packing, <laughs> which wasn't a lot at that age. I mean, mm. what, ten years old. Oh, <laughs> ten years old. Mm. And uh, but anyway, things developed on and started. You know, she kind of became my girlfriend. It was. And, um, Did anyone else know, or was it a secret? It was secret. It was a total secret. I mean, maybe other children might have suspected. Maybe other teachers might have suspected. It seemed like the, the school. A lot of the teachers had favourites, and you know, had certain ones that they 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 cared about more than the others. But I mean, we were maladjusted. That's what we were called in 1977. We were. We were called maladjusted. It was full of autistic children, Tourette's, kids with Tourette's, um, you know, with tics. Um, there was low, some some uh, physically abused, mentally abused children. Uh, there was about fifty of us in the school. Anyway, um, yeah, Mrs. I want to say her name. <laughs> This is this is it's hard to even talk about this, but yeah, we we developed the, the relationship started getting closer and closer, and you know, and more physical. And uh, her husband was studying to to be a social worker, so he'd stay he'd stay overnight at university on a Thursday night, and. Uh, she, she, they lived on top of the school, like it was an old uh, Norman hunting lodge, and they lived on top of the school uh, in their flat, a self contained flat on top of the school. So I used to wait for the night watchman to go to sleep, and I'd creep up the stairs, and she'd leave the door open, and I'd go into her flat and get into her bed, and she would use me. She used me to. For self gratification, she used me for her pleasure. I, it was fun to me. It was fun. It was different. I was. I felt I was special. I thought I was special. You know. 
Um, but later on in life, when I when I turn the tables and I think about it, for a, a married woman of 26 to be having sexual relationship with with a 10, 11 year old, 12 year old child, that's a bit insane, really. That's a bit crazy, man. That is. She's spelled no. she'd be classed as a paedophile. Yeah. You know that as well. It's, you yeah. know, and if it was the opposite, mm. you know, a male yeah. and, and it's a 10, 11 year old girl. Yeah. Then where does that go? Yeah, no. It, it, so do you feel that messed you up? Definitely. Definitely. It, it, fucked, you, it fucked me up because, with the relationship, with the relationship, with the, the way I have relationships with females. And, yeah. You know, even to this day, um, she was just a part of it. Like, I feel that my mother let me down, you know, putting me in and out of care. You Reje know, so you had loads of rejection, abandonments, mm. and then you had this woman who was showing you, you know, showing you an interest. And, you know, you felt important and special. Yeah. But she was just using you for her own personal gratification. Yeah. yeah and, and, and then just, just dropped and you. And then, yeah, and just dropped me. Well, I went to, because the... the the school I was at was kind of a junior school and there was a senior school called Southlands. So when I left, when I left Hill House and went to Southlands, um, you know, our relationship ended there and it was, the, she was very cold towards me. I mean, the, the way she, she used to play a lot of games with me, she used to play a lot of fucking mental games with me, with the relationship saying she used to like just, off the cuff, say it's on, it's it's on or it's off. She would say that as when she say when she was saying it's on, she meant our relationship. It's fine, it's our. But she, you know, she would wind me up mm. and say it's off. Just just like a little bit of a joke for her, a little to you know see my reaction. You know the relationship's off. So she, she was a bit of a sadist. She was she was a head fuck mate. Yeah, she yeah. really did fuck up my head from time to time. Really, it, it was it was quite savage, you know, the, the 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 shit that she put me through, like on that side, you know. Um, and at the end of it, she was she was very cold, very cold to me, and and that hurt again. That hurt. It was more rejection, but you know, it's something that I was getting used to. I was, you know, it was toughening my skin up, and um, yeah, it was another chapter. I went to Southlands, I was at Southlands for a, maybe a year or two, and then I came home. I went home, it was 1983, I went home. Uh, my two older sisters had been gone home before me, and my two younger brothers had gone home before me. So I'm, in, I'm still in, in my boarding school, and I'm, I'm the last one in care. I wanted to come home. I should have stayed there because I was doing, you know, I was doing pretty well academically. But um, I just wanted to be with my family. I miss my family. You know, I hadn't seen some of them for years and years. And, uh, you know, I wanted to be with my family. I wanted to be with the people that I loved and who I cared about. So I came home, uh, 1983. I'll never forget the actual day, we, the week I came home. Because we moved into a new, uh, new address in Plumstead, well, in Woolwich, Francis Street. And the night we moved in, the IRA, which was a terrorist organisation, some people won't even know who the IRA is, we're going back a bit. <laughs> the IRA blew up the army barracks, uh, Woolwich, Woolwich Artillery, they blew up the army barracks. They, they'd blown up the pub before, a few years before. But the night we moved in, they blew up um, part of the, the entrance to the, uh, the artillery. And uh, I slept through it. Is one of them. The rest of my family woke up, but I slept through that. And uh, but I think it was because I'd also that that same night there, I had some uh, had some tie stick. My sister's boyfriend, he gave me a couple of pulls on a on a joint. How old was you then? Uh, I was 13, 13, 14, I think. Fourteen, I think it was. Yeah, and he uh, that was the first time I ever had tie stick as well. So there was a few things going on that night. I had some tie stick, slept through an IRA bomb, and we moved to Francis Street, Woolwich, from Plumstead and Street. Um, I attended Woolwich Polytechnic School, 
that was the only school that would accept me after I come out of my boarding school. My two brothers were going to Eaglesfield School. Eaglesfield wouldn't have me. So I ended up going to Woolwich Polytechnic. And unfortunately, I left school with no qualifications. And bad attitude, big chip on my shoulder. And uh, more than a chip on my shoulder, most really a bag of chips on my shoulder. So I left school and I turned to crime almost straight away. Even before I left school, I was I was stealing. I used to go down to Woolwich in my lunch break and I'd be stealing clothes for myself because, you know, we were, we were poor. My, my mum had, you know, she was bringing up five kids on her own. She was a nurse, bringing up five kids on her own. It was a struggle. I know it was a struggle for her. So, uh, you know, I used to ask her for clothes and maybe get something, maybe get an item of clothing for Christmas, or so, you know, or, or for your birthday. But, you know, more more London Borough Lewisham was clothing me than my, my own mum. I mean, I was, I was still, even though I came home at 14 or 15, I was still under London Borough of Lewisham they were my parental garden, uh, guardians up until the age of 18. So, you know, maybe they would, I would get clothing grants here and there and I would, you know, once or twice a year from the social services, from my social worker. Um, so, you know, getting clothes, I, would, I was actually get ha hand-me-downs from, from my older sister who was a tomboy, lucky enough. And uh, I would wear her clothes, you know, I'd have to wear some of her stuff. Shoes, in back, like shoes and trainers and jumpers and things like that. Not the not the pants, <laughs> none <laughs> of that stuff, none of that kinky stuff. But yeah, the, the you know the main clothes. I'd have to. Uh, so I ended up stealing it. I ended up going shoplifting. I was shoplifting. And uh, so you were messed up before you'd even begun your journey in life. Really, yeah. you know you've been, you know you've been abandoned, rejected, put inside these care homes, you know, you've been groomed, you've, you, you've, look at it's, it, there's a lot going on, and you're smoking weed by the time you're 12, 13. Yeah, I was, I was nicking, my, my older sister, my older sister was a nurse, and, um, yeah, she was always, she was always smoking hashish, or some weed and stuff, so, I ended up nicking, nicking her puff, and taking it to the older guys, up the, up the road, up the estate, and they would roll the joints for me, and, yeah, I was smoking joints at 11. Smoking cigarettes at, at 8 and weed at 11. So was you on a cycle then of, um, of like, crime, drug taking? Yeah. Yeah, it was. I mean, I let, you know what it was? I never, had a, I never had a positive role model. Never. Teachers, some teachers in my boarding school. Yeah. Like most of the teachers in my boarding school were ex-army or ex-screws. Um, you know, so they were quite disciplinarian people and I needed that. My mum couldn't, my mum, when I come home, no, you know, my sister, my older sister had a boyfriend who was very, he was an alpha male and he played football and I, I loved this guy. He was like an idol to me, um, you know, and someone I wanted to be like. But he, you know, these men came and went, you know, relationships don't last and, I couldn't ask my sister to stay in a relationship because I, I really liked the guy, you know. And uh, yeah, I didn't have, I just didn't have the role models or the, the role models. I didn't have any, you know, anyone that inspired me. So I never really, I mean, to even think that I would get to this age, I never ever thought that I would make it to this age. I what never, age are you now? I'm 52. But I never thought I'd ever, I didn't, never, Ever in a million did I even think that I would one day be this age? Yeah. You know, I was it was just about getting through today and tomorrow and you know, I think yeah, it'd be nice when I get to twenty one and I can or eighteen and I just can just grateful for, 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 for certain ages to get through the day. Yeah. I mean I never never ever in a million thought that I'd make it to this age. I didn't. I thought you know, I thought I was gonna go out I thought I would have been dead before now. Really and truly. Is that what your lifestyle was like? Was there loads of um, violence involved in, in, in... Violence came later, yeah. The violence came, you know, when I when I came home, uh, I suppose the first bit of violence was, I was, 
I was 15 and I got into a fight. I got into a couple of fights with uh, over girls. I've all you know, love love treacles. Always, it's never gonna. That's never gonna change, and that's a problem that I've you know that I, that's one of the reasons why I can't have a long term, fully committed relationship is because I love females, and um, you know if I think I, if if I think I've got a chance and you know I might <laughs> pursue it. If I if I feel like I like the girl and I wanna like to be intimate with her, I will tr- pursue it, which is. You know, it's, so it's, it's commitments. You scared? You, you fear commitments? Yeah, because I just, you know, the trust issues. It's yeah. just too much. It's, uh, so I came home in '83. Uh, by '86, I was in prison. '84, um, '85, I was being arrested. I was arrested numerous times. Um, it started up. It was mainly shoplifting. Like I said, it was closed, but then I became quite a good shoplifter and it started becoming electrical goods. It's like CD, when CD players would just come out and video cameras had just come out and, you know, Walkmans were were big rage and uh, car cassettes, you know, things like that. So I was robbing as many car cassettes, as many uh, Walkmans, as many... CD players, as many ghetto blasts, whatever I could get my hands on, basically. To, I never thought. I'd, I mean, I wanted to. I would have liked to work. I was. A, I'm. I'm not shy of hard work at all. It's just at the time when I was 14, 15, I never had uh, any kind of direction or any idea of what I wanted to do. I, I played football. I love football, and you know, I've. I love football. It's saying that. Yeah, I would have liked to career him. But also in my when I was in my boarding school, there was a there was an outside football team, Lawrence Boys, and uh, me and this kid Marcel Kelman, you know Marcel, and uh, we played for the outside football team. But there was a boxing boxing uh, club there as well, Lawrence Boys. They had football and boxing. I wish I'd have, I really do wish that I would have got into the boxing because I know I know myself now that I know I'm a. I'm more of an individual, I'm more of a, you know, rather than a team player, I'm more of an individual type. Of, Independence. And, yeah, I like that one-on-one. That's why I got into the fighting later on. But it was late, but I I know, you know, I'm pretty confident in my own skills of survival. <laughs> I mean, I've done pretty well up until I had my first fight of surviving. And... Uh, you know, I was always fighting along the way. From the very first foster home I went into where I was a bit different. I was, you know, I had curly hair and I used to have hair. I mean, that's <laughs> the thing. I, I did used to have hair. It was, it was a big afro. Yeah. But um, I was different. So I was always having to fight. And it, it, it wasn't anything that I wasn't, put, you know, I actually not enjoyed it, but... You know, a few of the foster homes I went into and the, and the schools I attended, I became the best fighter in the school or, or that year, you know? So it's something that it was like something that I had to do. Every time I was fostered, every time every home I went into, I had to fight. There was a pecking order, you know, with the kids. And so I was always fighting. It's not so people say, oh, I was, I was fighting from, I, I really was fighting from the age of three. Um, up until up until today, you know, I'm still fighting. Uh, whether it's for equality or whether it's for you know to to get in the film, to yeah. to get on the on the, to be part of this stunt team or part of the cast, I'm still fighting. So, you know, but I've, I've, what doesn't what doesn't kill you makes you stronger, you know. Yeah. So, f- fighting from a young age, it was it was nothing. It was it was normal. You know, and then when I saw later on in life, when I saw a few of my friends doing it for for fun, I came out of prison. I see my friends doing it for, for trying to make a living out of out of fighting. I thought, yeah, why not, man? Let's give it a go. Let's have a go, man. It look, it looks like fighting. You don't get arrested, and you get paid. So what, 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 what did you uh, get yourself involved in? Was it? It was MMA. Yeah, it was MMA. I come out of. Um, it was one of my. One of my stints, just finished off a stint in uh, in Wayland, 
I got three years for drug dealing. Uh, it was 2000. I came home end of 2000 and uh, I see a friend of mine fighting, uh, fighting Valley Tudo. I mean, I'd seen him in the, I'd seen him on on the TV and seen him in the middle of newspapers and stuff. And I spoke to him on the phone. I was like, "What are you doing? What's all this?" And he was like, "Yeah, I'm doing this thing called Valley Tudo." And I was like, "Valley Tudo? What's Valley Tudo?" I knew judo. I'd done judo in my boarding school. Uh, got to a blue belt. And uh, I was like, what's this Valley 2 day? And he's like, yeah, it's free fighting. It's like all in. So I, I came home. I saw him fighting. And uh, yeah, it, look, it looked awesome. And I thought, do you know what? Why not, might as well give it a go. Yeah. I've been doing it on the years for, <laughs> on the year, on the street for years. I might as well get paid for it. I might as well give it a proper go. Yeah, and that was, uh, that was the start of my and What MMA. year was that? Well, I came home in 2000, but I never actually had my first, but I came home in the end of 2000. So it was end of 2000. So 2001, I was training hard. I was training hard at London Shoot Fighters with Lee. And uh, I kept saying to him, look, I'm, I want to fight. I want to fight. I want to fight. They won't get me to fight. So I was on this, this course. The unemployment had put me on this course and... I had access to a computer, so I was using this. I used this computer to get my first fight. I just entered myself into this this thing. It's uh, I see this fighters wanted circus tavern, and I put myself forward for it. I put myself forward for it. They it was my first fight, and uh, matched me up with this guy called Ryan Robinson, who was a jujitsu jujitsu guy. So. Uh, yeah, it was Valentine. It was, it was like I put myself forward about December, November, December, and then I had the fight coming up in February, and it was on Valentine's Day. So, because it was my first fight, I thought, I thought, oh, I'll abstain. I'll abstain from physical contact with with the females mm. <laughs> <laughs> for about a week. No, no, it was actually two weeks, and it was it's funny old, funny old turnout. Because I was in, I, I, I didn't like being in the blue corner, so I changed the, the tags over and put myself in the red corner. And uh, Ryan, I didn't know Ryan Robinson was my opponent, but he was in the changing room with me and I was playing my drum and bass and going a bit high and I was a bit pissed off and I was geeing up the red team. And uh, someone asked me if I knew who I was fighting. I said, no, nah, I don't know the guy. His, his name's Ryan Robinson. And then some kid at the back put his hand up like that and she's like, that's me. You're in the wrong change room. So I was like, I apologise, left the change room. But I think I'd already won the fight. I did. I mean, it wasn't in, on purpose that I... I think I won that fight through just being so high and, and uh, you know, it's just so up for it. You could see me, but like, I was dancing my drum and bass. I was going mad. Um, you know, I was excited, first fight. And uh, yeah, I remember coming out, and then he came, or he came out first, and then I came out, and I looked over at the ring, over at the ring at him, and he kind of nodded over to me like we were friends, and I thought, mate, you don't know what's coming, you don't know what's coming for you, mate. When when the, when the bell go, after the fight, we can be friends, you know. But <laughs> trust me, I, I, I pounded on it. It went to the floor, but. I mean, I caught him with his right hand and he fell on top of me and I threw him on the floor and it kind of woke him up and then I give him some more and he he uh, tapped out to the ground and pound. That's, that's what won me in that first fight. The next fight, completely different story, which was um, terrible. It was my first time I'd ever been knocked out by a guy, Craig Hammer from Dover. Good bare knuckle fighter, veteran. He was a veteran before. This was my second fight, and the promoter stitched me up. I ain't even. I'm not trying to make excuses, but the promoter stitched me up. Lee took me to the fight. We was fighting at. It was Millennium Brawl. Lee took me to the fight. I was supposed to be fighting a guy called Nick Franchino. That was in the uh, in the program. When we got to the when we got to the venue, Nick Franchino had pulled out or something. He pulled out a couple of days before, so. Andy Jardine, who was the promoter, he uh, he got me a replacement fighter. He got me a replacement fighter called Craig, 
Craig Emma, who had had, he'd had over 30, 40 fights, this guy. He was he was a veteran. He'd been in there, he'd done K1, <laughs> MMA. He, he was a dangerous guy. But the funny thing was, is I see, I see him fight on a show before with Lee. And he fought this guy called um, Andy Langdon. So Andy Langdon and uh, Craig Emma have come out and they both come out windmilling. They're fucking throwing these... And I've never seen nothing like it. They got a, it was a double KO. They've knocked each other out, yeah. But after I think the eight count, one of them got up. But um, I don't know if he won the fight. I think he did win the fight. It was Andy Langdon. He got up at, at the count of eight or the count of ten, just before ten. He they like I swear, I've never seen nothing like it. They both come out win me win. Bam! Both both landed the right hand. They both gone down. Andy's got up and won the fight. So I, I knew to myself, because one thing I've always been blessed with is the knockout power. Um, from the eight, from I knocked out my first store detective when I was 15 <laughs> at Bromley Alders. And uh, ended up getting 15 months for this, this knockout. It cost me 15 months in uh, detention centre in Huntercombe. And uh, yeah, that was the first time I ever knocked someone out. And this guy was a big guy. And and I think, you know, some people are just blessed with that power, with the knockout power. And other people need more technique, you know, to, to render people unconscious. But there's some people that are just blessed and they've got that one shot, one you know, one shot kill. And I was blessed with that. And so was my brother, David. Um, George, I don't know. I don't really know so much about George, but me and David definitely <laughs> did. Um, but yeah, I, I fell in love with uh, MMA. As soon as I had the first fight, I fell in love with it. But the second one was, um, it was scary because it was an actual cage fight. The first fight I had, it was in a ring. And I'd always trained in the ring, but the second fight was a cage fight with Craig Emma. So we got there and you know, I'm I'm actually in the cage now and I'm like, fucking hell, what am I doing here? I'm looking across the ring at this guy and he looks like me. He's just a shorter version, stocky, big tattoo down his arm. Yeah, he's like, fuck it. I'm like, shit, what the fuck? Anyway, he's come out, we've come out, thrown a few shots. I threw a leg kick. No, he threw a leg kick, kicked me. So I wanted to return the leg kick. I've thrown the leg kick and I've dropped my hands. He's jumped in, caught me with his left hook. Peach, out. It's the first time ever I've been knocked out. The only other thing that had knocked me out before that was baseball bats. I had two baseball bats over the girls that I was getting to. The fights over girls. Both times I ended up fucking having a, a range. Well, the first time it was actually my baseball bat that fucking done me. I took it with me. I've ended up fighting with two kids, two guys who abused this girl. Uh, my, she was kind of my girlfriend. And uh, I've chased them up the road with a baseball bat. They run around the corner, got their brother and their uncles come back and they fucking both done me. The, uh, the brother done me there and the uncle done me on the back of the head. And then about a year later, I got into it again over another girl. and. Uh, we had an arranged fight. This was an arranged fight. So I've gone to have a fight with this kid, but he's got a few pals there and one of them's got a baseball bat. And I thought, fucking hell, man. The last thing I want is another baseball bat over the head. And uh, yeah, it happened. I smashed this guy up. I cut him. Cut his eye open with a punch. And um, the guy with the baseball bat saw it. Didn't like it. Went to whip me round the legs. I blocked the one with the legs, and he done me round the fucking back of the back of the canister with the fucking baseball bat. Woke up just as the kid was running up, shaping up to fucking to kick me in the in the air. So I jumped up, I'm ready to tear up with the fella again. But that was the end of the fight. You know, I went and got some stitches, and uh, you know, ever ever from that day, I thought, you know what, I'm not gonna. Get locked out. I'm not going to have anyone put, <laughs> use a weapon on me. It's like, you know, I'll use the weapon if I have to, you know, I'll go first. I'm not not going to be the victim. That was that was my thing after that. Two times I got hit with baseball bats. You know, well, fuck that, mate. Never again. Never again, mate. I'm, I'll do the fucking it in now. And yeah, it kind of kind of switched me a bit. But um, yeah, the third the third straw that broke the camel's back 
was um, was this girl from was this girl called Natalie, and uh, I met Natalie at a, at a party. I was I was six, 17, 16, 16, 17, I met this girl and um, we was at this party and uh, yeah, I fell in love straight away. I was like, wow, she's half Irish, half Iranian, this girl. And uh, yeah, I ended up falling for her hard. Anyways, I was being such a naughty boy at the time, I was in and out getting nicked, left, right and centre, for shoplifting mainly, shoplifting and car, cause it, and maybe a bit of violence here and there, nothing major. But, um, you know, the cases were piling up, piling up, piling up. And, uh, you know, I went away. I went away. <clears throat> maybe I should have gone on a run, but I don't think it would have, you know, it would have changed anything. Yeah. Um, so the girl was writing me letters and, you know, oh, I miss you so much. Oh, baby. I went to a party the other day and I, I see someone, he was just like you. He was So I was kind of, I could read it in the letter, you know, that she was missing me and she was looking maybe for some... Uh, a replica. Yeah. <laughs> so anyway, I'm in my cell in Huntercombe and this geezer comes in from Wandsworth, this fella, Sean Nugent. <laughs> And he's come in my cell and he's gone, uh, I know that girl. She, we, I was at Putney Fair with her last week. She's with my mate. That was the, that was the straw that broke the camel's back. For when it comes to relationships with females and trust issues, that was the absolute, you know, from my mum to the teacher to Natalie, that was it. My heart was, that was it. The heart had been broke beyond repair and Ever since that day, I've never been able to, even though the last, I'd say the last 20, 20 years, I've had the best, the best woman in my life. The most loyal, you know, my baby mum. I've got four sons. I've got three with, with I've got one with one. He's, he's 34 now. Uh, he was born in 86 while I was away. And, um, uh, and then I've got three with a, with another woman, and you know, that's my family there. Even though I'm not, even though I'm not in a fully committed relationship with her, that's my family. You know, that I, I would die for. I'd do anything for my children. They mean the world to me. They're the most important thing in my life. But um, I've never been able to give her what she deserves. You know, and I'm, I, I apologise for that openly. Because, you know, she deserves much more than what I could give her. You know, she deserves the world. For the loyalty she's shown me and the love, you know, she deserves the world. But I just, I've never been able to commit since. You've had, yeah, so you've, you've, you've had all those traumatic relationships and you can understand, you know, that you've been, um, you've been hurt. Mm. Which is, which, which has an impact on. And how you communicate and, and how you you trust, like you said before. You know, I've been here, mate. It's not nice. It's fucking horrible. You know, because um, I'm, I'm I don't know whether I'm like yourself, mate. I wear my hat on my sleeve. Mm. You know, and it's um, I can abandon myself, sell myself short, shell for crumbs, shell for less. You know, be a bit bit of a codependent, a bit needy. You know, wanting to be loved. I've had all that growing yeah, up. Yeah. You know, because I've, I've I've also experienced that rejection. Yeah. I've also experienced that abandonment at an early age. Mm. So I know how it feels when I'm I'm chasing and screaming for someone to like me and want me and need mm. me. Mm. I, I I'm not having that. I'm mm. not reaching it. Yeah. To, to, there's a thin line between vulnerability and anger. So I switch. You know, I choose to be angry because I'm more comfortable with it, and I, I, I and I avoid being vulnerable because. You know, it, it, it's seen as a weakness. Yeah. So I can't be upset. I, I, yeah. So yeah. I just, I just, I just dismiss it, and yeah. you know, I become cold. Yeah. You know, I become really, yeah. really yeah. cold towards people. Yeah. You know, and it's exactly. um, it, it, it's a lonely place to be. It is. So I can understand what you um, what you've been through and what you're still going through. You know, but so your career. You, see, see, for me, boxing, right? This is this is my my analogy of it, right? You can put me in the ring and you can punch me head in. Mm. I can take blows all day long. Yeah. You know, you can put a plaster yeah. on a cut. Mm. You know, you, mm. a, a broken arm can heal. Yeah. You can heal a leg. Yeah. You know, take exactly. me out the ring. Yeah. 
You know, you can't put a plaster on a broken heart. No, exactly. You know, all those feelings. Exactly. But men, the emotional and and the emotional scars on your heart. Yeah. You know, that people can't see. Yeah. People can't. They, they're the worst. They're the, and they're the, they take the longest to heal. Yeah. But like you say, scars is. Like, I'd never ever give a fuck about yeah. what I look like. As far as I was concerned, because of the, the I'm like I must be fucking. No one can like me. Yeah. You know, this ain't wrong with me. Because my mum don't love me. Mum, the, you know, the woman in the in the school fucking used me and she don't love me. And Natalie cheated on me and don't love... I must... There's something wrong with me. I don't give a fuck. And that is... It's one of the reasons why I fucking... I wish I'd have found MMA sooner or found... Because the, the anger issues and the, and the heartbreak and the way to deal with it, you know... I, like, I've never had... You know, everyone's got a bit of vanity. I ain't going to say I'm, you know, but the broken heart is not the, a fucking broken nose is nothing to, you know, a broken yeah, arm yeah. is nothing. A, a fucking, your nose tear took off your face is nothing, you know, compared to the... The emotional upheaval. The, yeah, the, the, yeah. To the, what, I've, what I've been through already yeah. is nothing. It's, it's, it's like, it's, I, I wouldn't give a fuck if it's King Kong, you know. <laughs> Show me the money, I will fight. I will fight. I will give, give you entertainment, you know. It, that was my my thing. I didn't it's give, also didn't it was fuck. also for me anyway. It was all it was an escape. It was an yeah. escapism. I ended. I I, ended, I say I fought a lot over in Southeast Asia, uh, and I was fighting sometimes three four times a night. I don't know why. That's insane. It was, it was just it was just because you're, you're insane. It was the addiction, right? I was addicted. Yeah. yeah. Because you, every time you took me away from that, and I was in society in the community, I felt really vulnerable. I felt mm. less than, I felt mm. like I didn't fit in, mm. but I felt like someone when I was facing, like you said, and it, like I, I wasn't a team player growing up. No one had passed me the ball. I, I felt I, I was better as, as a sole independent. The one-on-ones. Yeah, the one-on-ones. Not the like team, was, you know, not the team player. So how, how, many, how often was your, um, how many fights did you have? You fought Michael Bispin as well, didn't you, a few times? Yeah, I had a couple of fights with Michael Tell us a little bit about that, come on. Um, <laughs> Well, the first time, I mean, I didn't know who he was. He, he was, uh, he, he was, uh, he was cracking on, having a few wins. He was doing well, and um, Cage Rage wanted me to fight for for a title. Or I had the title. I, yeah, I had the title already, and um, he, they wanted me to fight Michael Bisping, which was cool. He was, I heard he was a kickboxer and that. He was ten years younger than me, so I'm 34. That's when I had my first fight. I was 34 when I had my first fight, which is a bit late in the day, really. Because, you know, if it had been 24, completely different story. You know, I wish I'd have found MMA sooner. Wish I had, you know. Because of the anger, the anger issues that I, I have or had, you know, it was a great outlet. It was a great way of turning that negative feeling into a positive, you know, into something positive and people saying oh you know that was that was good mark you did well there you know you sh showed a lot of heart and you sh good chin and you know so it was a confidence booster it was uh wasn't not saying it was stroking my ego but it was it was it's, it's, it builds your self-esteem definitely there's, there's a lot of it uh, there's a lot of a repair going on when you're um when you're so like you know you're in the gym and people are ag and acknowledging your skills you're winning, mm. you know, even when you're losing, you know, yeah. it's experience, you're learning. Yeah. yeah, It's not like a failure. No one's going, yeah. right, you know, you, you you need to do this. You know, you didn't do that, right? They're just giving you a bit of support and a bit of guidance. So that was like, it's like a family, so to speak, isn't it? Yeah, but with the captain, the London Shoot Fighters and um, Elton Warriors, you know, and uh, I've done a bit over at the Peacock as well. It was a great set of people, great sparring partners, you know, some great coaches. Um, yeah, my first fight with Bispin, um, I made some mistakes. You know, I ain't got no excuse. He's a good fighter, good fighter, but he, uh, I mean, if he, he, Lee, my friend of mine, Lee, he said to me he counted 19 punches, 19 clear punches he hit me in the face. He punched me around the whole octagon in the second round of the first fight. I hit him once as I was going backwards with a right hand and dropped him, dropped him to one knee in the first round of the first fight we had. 
I know if I would have been stepping forward into that punch, I would have took his head off. If he woke up now, you know, I would have knocked the. He couldn't take the the power I got, and he, he you know, he was in and out with the with with the punch. He didn't want to have a trade up and stand there and trade up and go toe to toe. Yeah. The second fight was a rematch. Um, I mean, the first fight, I, I ain't gonna lie, I was I was using ephedrine. Yeah. So I was using ephedrine for the fight and it was giving me good cardio. I was doing my cardio, I was smashing the cardio. But where I was a bit naive and stupid, on the day of the fight, I took two two of these uh, diametrine, they were called, which is ephedrine. So the first round, I've come out and I'm fucking, we're, we're going at it. We're going right at it. The second round, I come out, I couldn't even, could not even hold my, the lactic has it. I couldn't even hold my hands up. <laughs> they, the fucking, my arms were fucked. He just punched me around the whole to referee stop the fight on the TKO. All right, I'll take that one and it's my own fault. The second one was not my fault. The second one, like last night, last night, me and my mate were driving around London. We was on, trying to get home and we went, through, went to go through the Blackwall Tunnel and fucking Blackwall Tunnel was closed. And there was major fucking traffic uh, disruption all over the place. We had to get to the Rotherive Tunnel to get home. So anyway, the, the day of the second, the day of our second fight, we've gone to go through the Blackwall Tunnel, Blackwall Tunnel shut. We've had to get on the M25 and go all the way around the M25 to get to fucking Wembley, to get to Wembley for the fight. I've sat two hours in the back of a car, two hours in the back of a car. When I've got to fucking Wembley, the geezer was got, uh, the, one of the promoters, Andy Gear, has gone to me, you're on in 15 minutes. I just about got my hand banged. I didn't even have time to warm up. This is a, it was a liberty that I've got to go. I've got my hand bandaged and I've got straight into the ring, not even warmed up, not even warm, couldn't even warm up because my fight was one of the first fights on Sky. It was programmed. You can't, you're in, you're fighting. Mm. Even though I just sat in a fucking car for two hours in traffic because Blackwall Tunnel was closed. That is why I didn't even, you know, I didn't even have a chance to warm up, but it still, I still took it to the third round and still I was a Rizzler paper away from winning that fight. I was kicking that low leg, chopping that low leg and he, I had him limping. I had that guy limping around the fucking <laughs> ring, yeah, hobbling. So when the second round, in the second round, I spat some water on the floor. We're, at, we're into the third round and I've slipped on the water on the floor. I've slipped. He's hit me with a right hand punch on the top of the head. It was nothing. Like he did drop me. He dropped me in the second round of the fight with a left hand, with a left hook. He dropped me, put me hands up to that. I, he dropped me. Didn't put me out, but dropped me. The, the fight that finished it, I slipped over and the referee has stopped the fight. I slipped over. That is what it was. It was a slip. It was 17 seconds before the end of the fight. For that guy to say that he knocked me out, he's never, Michael Bispin, you have never, ever <laughs> knocked me out. Never, ever. Yeah, that's the only, you know, I've got bare respect for you because of what you've achieved. Good luck to you, bro. I'll take my hat off to you. But you never, ever knocked me out. So stop telling people you did because you never did, mate. That was a bad decision from Grant Waterman that gave you that knockout. That's who it was. And, and it's only because of, I had drug convictions that I didn't go for Ultimate Fighter. That's the only reason I didn't come over there and fucking give you a third fight. But anyway, enough respects. <laughs> <laughs> Moving forward, <laughs> yeah, so yeah, you sorry, got that off Sorry, mate. <laughs> sorry, Bill. Because he's, he's he said it. I've seen it in a few things. He said it. Oh, I was knocking them all out. I knocked out. Him. You didn't. You never knocked me out ever. <laughs> right. Let's just get that straight right now. Wait, that's straight. You sorted that out. Yeah. He never knocks you out. You slipped. <laughs> Hands off. Watch the any. Watch the fight. It's on YouTube. Second round. You see what. I mean, if you watch the whole fight, you see me in the second round, spit water on the floor. There was not, I didn't have a bucket. I don't know why I spat the water, but I spat it on the floor. Third round, I slipped over in that same fucking water. And you'll see it on the replay. You, you watch watch the fight, you see it. I'm not bullshitting. I'm not trying to make excuses. Michael Bishop is a good fighter, but he never had the concussive power to knock me out, ever. The first fight, 
He punched me around the whole octagon, 19 punches. You think one stupid little punch at the end of the fucking fight? No. Grant Waterman gave that, that was a bullshit decision and you know it, but you know, you and you saw the slip. You even admitted to me, Grant Waterman yourself, you saw the slip, you know, and yeah, in the hindsight, you shouldn't have called that as, it was never a knockout, but it's what it is, you know. You got it on your record, Michael Bisping, good luck, but never <laughs> ever, you never ever did. Sorry about that. <laughs> That's okay. <laughs> <laughs> so what was your career after that? Well, yeah, uh, you know, I had, uh, how many, I think I had, I mean, MMA, I, I, I had 14 wins, 14 wins, 11 losses. So it was half, an, you know, it, was, it wasn't great, but I had a couple of titles and I also had a um, couple of titles with some uh, K1 and some, some Muay Thai rules. Uh, IKF, I had a world title um, back in 2005 as well. So yeah, I had a, you know had a few titles. It was a bit a bit late in the day to be getting on there because most people most people are retiring in their in their thirties and early forties. I was just starting, so yeah. you know. You gave as good as you got, and you you enjoyed it the same I loved time, it. didn't you? I loved it. I wouldn't change any of it. You know, it was it was beautiful. I loved it, even the losses. They weren't so much, you know, it, it was more of a learning curve. You learn, you learn. It weren't, you know, it was, it was you take the losses and uh, just take it on the chin and just move on. So you got a, you know, you, you've also had a, a career, or you've still got a career in, in, in stunt work, haven't you? You've been on loads of movies. I've seen all the pictures. You've I love, I love film. I've always loved film since I was a child. I've always loved watching film. You know, my first, my first sweetheart was uh, Snow White. That was one of the first films I went to the cinema and I fell in love with Snow White and that was it, you know. But I've always loved film and uh, and TV series. And it, like even in my boarding school, in my boarding school, there was 50 kids and there was, uh, we had this system called the ladder system and it was like they judged each child on a ladder system. So the top 10 boys of the ladder would get to stay up and watch Starsky and Hutch or they'd get to stay up and watch the, the professionals or the Sweeney maybe and uh, on a Friday night when they did the, the, the ladder we, we'd done it after dinner we, uh, after tea on a Friday Friday tea time we'd do the ladder and the top 10 boys would be announced and they'd get to stay up till 9 o'clock and watch or past 9 and watch Starsky and Hutch or the professionals it's only a few times I ever got to do that. Um, the biggest regret was when I didn't get to go and see Greece, which was <laughs> <laughs> like that was the reward for the top. That I finished eleven. I've got shields like the yeah. multiplayer. Oh mate, I love. I was a huge um, Greece fan. You know, huge. I remember I got the double album for Christmas off my sisters. I, I was I was playing it nonstop for the next six months. Um, yeah, and uh, that was that that was heartbreaking uh, that I didn't get to see Greece, but <laughs> it was good staying up, you know, staying up and watching the professionals. Because me and this kid, this guy called Richard Clay, we used to we built our own assault course down at the. We used to have a field in the boarding school. We had field, big field where we played football and that. And there was a bit of waste ground over there. And me and Richard Clay would build our assault course like the professionals, and we'd do we'd do the assault course and. We're pretending to be Bodie and Doyle. Obviously, I'm I'm Bodie. You know, the bad. <laughs> he was the bad man. Bo, uh, Doyle was a bit bit pretty, wasn't he? he was with his, he had the perm and that. He was a bit pretty, <laughs> but Bodie was like proper. So um, yeah, that Lewis Collins was there. Yeah, yeah Lewis yeah. Collins, big fan. And then he done uh, Who Dares Wins. Great film. You know, shame about the guy. He died a bit early, but before his time, didn't he? But um. No, I was a big fan of all the action, you know, and uh, I never ever thought that one day I'd be involved and I'd be doing it. It's a bit of a mad, um, mad one. I was coming to the end of my fighting career and it's about 2011 and I put myself full for some extra work and it was uh, my first extra work was on a film called uh, For The Dark World, a Marvel film. So I'm on this Marvel film and weird, weird, I... I I mean, we're, we're having this big battle scene and I'm running around with a fake sword trying to chop up anyone I can. Any, any, <laughs> trying to Just trying to get a victim, chop someone up and, you know. 
and uh, I'm chopping up these people and they're like, you can't do that, you can't do, we've we got us, we, we're SPAC. I'm like, what? SPAC? What the fuck is SPAC? Special Action Extra. Yeah. So I'm like, well, what's that? It's like, oh, well, we do stage combat. I was like, what's stage combat? I didn't have a clue. Anyway, I'm on the film and just by chance, a friend of mine was a fight coordinator or assistant fight coordinator and I used to go to school with him. When I came home from boarding school, I went to Woolwich Polytechnic and this, there was a guy there called Morris Lee. Very, very good stunt man, one of the best in the business, but he's also, he could have been a pro boxer as well. He, he was supposed to um, fight professionally, but damaged his eye. Retina, he had a retina um, injury. So he got into stunt work and he became, he, he's now, I mean, now he's a stunt coordinator. He's his own boss. But um, I met him on the film. I ain't seen him for years and we're on the film working together and I started asking him about this these, these spack and um, his stage combat. And he said to me, Mark, if you want to you wanna get involved in this, you're going to have to do stage combat. If you want to do stunts, you've got to do this, that. But, so he gave me lots of advice and I went and done some uh, stage combat courses and started putting myself forward for for films and more action type things. And yeah, you know, it's, I mean, I'm, I'm play fighting in films. I'm pretending play fighting in films. It doesn't hurt so much. Sometimes, I mean, I've done a film the other day with Ray Winston. And uh, I was I had to take some body shots off of one of the lead actors. He was he was hitting me to the body, and I'm, he he bruised up my ribs. Yeah. It did hurt. <laughs> it's been a while since I've had someone bang, 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 banging on the ribs. But um, you know, I love I love film work. I love it. I can't wait to see the film. You know, just to be in the scene with Ray Winston was it's uh, an honour. You know to be working with people like that. Have you, have you worked alongside? Mm. Oh, weird. Well, Chris Hemsworth was, Chris Hemsworth was lovely for, he's a beautiful guy, he signed a couple of photos to my boys, you know, lovely fellow, Tom Hiddleston who plays Loki, he signed, a, he signed a, some some photos for my son. Um, but one, I think one of the nicest guys I've ever worked with, or work, yeah, worked with was, um, Benedict Cumberbatch. He was he was a lovely fellow. Guy who plays Doctor Strange. He was a lovely fellow. I worked with him on a thing called Hollow Crown, which was a thing about the War of the Roses. Uh, you know, it was a Shakespeare, a new Shakespeare type thing. Uh, he was a lovely fella. Uh, but I think my favourite guy I worked with was a guy called Toby Kebble, who was. In oh, Toby, yeah. Brilliant film. I watched this brilliant film, yeah, called Dead Man's, Dead Man's Shoes. Shoes. Yeah. And fucking blew me away. The 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 acting of Toby Kebble in that film blew me away, yeah. I was like, fucking, how the fuck have they got this spastic? Like, because that's what I thought. I thought he was a spastic, yeah. I thought, the, how the fuck have they got this retarded guy to do this? this and then I found out he wasn't. He was, he was normal. Like, I was like, and I was amazed that this guy had portrayed this character. It's just amazing, amazing. It blew me away. And I actually got to work with Toby on Ben Hur in Italy. And uh, it was really, it was, it was, it was such an eye opener, and it was an amazing experience to to work with someone of Toby's caliber. Yeah, it was, it was, it was such an honor. Yeah, he was a he was a really great guy. And he, you know, I mean, not. I've never ever say I'm an actor because I'm. Not, I don't want to be an actor. I'm, I love stunts. I like the rough and the tumble. I don't mind saying the line here or there, but I really, I love the stunts. And uh, you know, I'm not trying to be a thespian of any kind, you know. But um, but it's important. Though, people need to understand that you know, people like yourself are important in these in these films because without the likes everyone. of yourself. Everyone in the film is important. Oh, there, there's a liability. You know, there's insurance. They can't do what you're doing. I, I understand. I worked alongside Stallone and, um, and it was great mm. just being on set. Yeah. You know, with the grip and all, yeah. all... See, the people that are not, like, actually on the big screen are the ones that are most important. Yeah. The, you know, the wardrobe. Yeah. The, the people who do the catering. Yeah. The, the people who do all the grips, the lighting, the lot. Yeah. You know, I, 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 I interacted with all them. You know, I, I spent a bit of time with Sly and... Um, 
That's what he called me, Yo Shlai. But he was, it was, it was, um, that was wicked. It is. It's an awesome. incredible, yeah. kind of, because he was my hero growing up. Rocky, yeah. Rambo, yeah. Yeah. all that. Yeah, he's a hero. No, he, he's, he's definitely he's, a hero. Yeah, so man. it was just see. That makes me. I I would have loved. I really would have loved to to um, pursue that as a career, uh, because he enjoyed that environment. He enjoyed meeting these new people. It was just down to earth, and I've had. You know, I'm really grateful that I've had the opportunity as well to to be on sets. I've been on the set of Gangs of London, I've been on Black Mirror, I've been um, on Peaky Blinders. Been on should have been on that. I should yeah. have been on that. I was actually talking to the director. Gangs of London? Yep. Yeah. I was talking to the director because the director was very interested in doing uh, doing a film on, on a friend of mine, Lee. Um, Lee Murray. That's the last time I'm going to mention his name. Um But he, he, you know, if you know me, you know that he was a good friend of mine and you know what he went on to do? He went on to do the biggest robbery in the history of, of England, 53 million pound. You know, I, I looked after that guy for years, for years, before his first course of steroids, before his first fight, I looked after him. When he had a problem, he would come to me. Now, you know, he broke my heart. He broke my heart because he did a bit of work and he forgot about me. And to be honest, if I could roll back the tire and, and he, he offered me that bit of work, I'll be honest, I put my hands up. For an hour, two hours work to nick five million pound, I would have I been there. You know, but in hindsight, it's a good thing I wasn't. Um, but, you know, um, regarding Lee, saying that he, you know, he did break my heart because the amount of loyalty I showed that guy you know, I thought I deserved that opportunity to have been on that bit of work, but obviously not. He didn't, uh, you know, I wasn't worthy enough to be, you know, I didn't put in enough time or whatever. I don't know what it was, why his reason was that he didn't give me that opportunity, but, you know, I've, I've, it broke my heart, to be honest. But, you, you know, it's not saying that I'm not... Ca- yeah. More than capable of dealing with that. It's not the first time it's happened. So not the first time you've had your heart broke. Exactly, yeah. I've had the rejection of not yeah. being part of. Uh, and it, it goes. It works both ways, male and female. It's you know friends because we don't. You know relationships are not all sexual. No, you no know, relationships. You know are, are with friends and family. You know, and, and and when they break down... Well, I classed him as a brother. Yeah. I classed him as a brother and, you know, obviously I, he didn't class me as a brother. He, he didn't hold me in that um, in that same esteem, you know? Yeah. Which was a shame. But, um, yeah, just just want to quickly, lightly touch on something. Please. So, anyway, Lee, Lee's away. And he's asked me... He's away, he's doing 25 years for the for what happened to him. You know, so anyway, he's asked me to um, talk to this guy from from ESPN, uh, E60, a guy called Sean Lassell. So I'm talking to Sean Lassell, it's about an interview. We, I did an interview with Sean and I took him around Barnfield Estate and took him around Woolwich. And uh, I told him about a time when I, I got into a bit of an altercation and at the time I was I was smoking crack heavily. I was selling crack. I was very I was d- deep down in in the grimiest bullshit you could imagine, yeah. yeah. And I'm and I, I ended up walking around, I'm walking around with a thing, with a tool, with a strap. Cuz I've got beef. I'm beefing with people who are, who, who are loons, they're lunatics. I'm beefing with these people and I know that it's me or them type thing, but I'm also smoking heavily this crack cocaine. And um, I've got into, I got into some altercation anyway, I've, I've ended up fucking letting off the thing. It's not saying I'm proud of that at all. I'm not trying to make, you know, glamorize any of this. Um, I got into an argument with a, with a guy. I was we was running a club together. He was the manager. I was the head of security. But this club was so. This club was. It was like a proper spill, proper dive spill. 
you know, I would do the security there. I would do the security there. And after a certain time and night, it became a crack house. The, the club became a crack house. And I was, I was selling all the crack. I was giving the managers a certain amount of crack cocaine over the weekend so that I could, so that I was the only dealer in there. Plus I was head of security. So I'm head of security and I'm the crack dealer. I was, I had a bad habit myself at the time. So I'm just doing it to fund my own habit. I'm not doing it to make money. Yeah, I, I didn't make any money from it. I just supported my habit, which was a really bad habit. Mm. It's a couple hundred pound a day for, for years, this went on. Anyway, I got into an argument with, with one of the managers. He, he sacked me, we've got into, I've had to, but I had to borrow some money to pay for the stock. And uh, he didn't want to pay me back the money or something. Which he's tried to, tried to take me for a dick. I had a thing, a five shot, two five automatic plotted up somewhere. I went and got that, put my bulletproof vest on, went back down to the club and I was going to, I was going to ping the guy. I've gone to ping him. I've gone to, I'm pulling the thing and it's not working. I'm like, fuck it. I've just paid 1100 quid for this thing and it's not working. It don't work. I've had to run up the road. He's pulled out a nine mil. I had to run up the road. I run into a park and I'm looking at this thing. <clears throat> and then I've managed to take the safety catch off. And so, you know, I didn't shoot my friend because I, the safety catch was on the thing. It was the first time I'm handling the automatic. So I, I didn't let, I forgot about the safety. Anyway, a couple of weeks later, we, my governor, who I was working for, this guy, this old guy, Charlie, his name was, he was, uh, he was an import, he, he did importations. The, the way I got to know Charlie was a friend of mine flew 60,000 pound out to New York in his luggage. And they had a weekend in the Waldorf Astoria. And he was paid a couple of thousand pound to fly the money out. And he was picked up at the, the airport in a big limousine, some Italian guy, and he's come back and told me this story, and, I, and he's, he's like, he's mentioned the mafia, he's like, yeah, I swear they was mafia, yeah? So I'm like, you know someone in Woolwich who works with the mafia? <laughs> so I was, like, <laughs> I was like, you gotta introduce me. So introduced me to this guy, I started working for him. He, re he remembered me, because I had a, there was a fight in Woolwich it was a few years ago and he seen me not or he was in a shop and he saw me knock out a security guard. he remembered me from some violence so he took me under his wing and I started working for Charlie Charlie was a mate he was a drug importer that's that was his job he was getting drugs from America he was getting drugs from Europe from Spain from Holland and he his partner in the end I mean his partner grasped him up turned QE on him and he ended up getting 12 years but um, before this Charlie, um, Charlie was importing some some hashish for one of his uh, clients, and uh, Dave. What happened was, is the parcel the parcel got lost. He was working with this other guy, who just got arrested, and when he was arrested, they found a warehouse receipt on him. So he, they went to the they no they arrested him under suspicion of something. They took him to his house, they raided his house, they found a warehouse receipt. They went to the warehouse, they found 400 kilos that belonged to this guy. But this guy was an ex-partner of my boss. Just by chance, my, my boss had 200 kilos of hashish in there. So they found 600 kilo and they put it on this fella, but only 400 was really his. So my governor is trying to explain to these clients, his clients that, your parcel's been lost. Custom and exercise have got your part. Let me get some paperwork and I'll prove it. By chance, he he had just given me 30 kilos of hashish. So I, I ended up selling hashish to their customers because they, they didn't have none. So their customers were going with that, but the, I knew them. So they came to me and I ended up selling some of them like five, 10 kilos. And um, they heard about it. And they, they put two and two together and, and come up with six. They thought that my boss had robbed them. They thought I was selling their puff to their customers. It was all a, a complete misunderstanding. But anyway, 
they they came to they came to my my governor lived. I will tell you where he lived. Where they did the murder. Where they killed um, the the soldier. Oh, what is his name again? The, the, the two black Rigby. That's it. Lee Rigby. That tower block outside was where my governor used to live. My governor used to live on the 18th floor of that tower block. So I've come downstairs because um, what happened was there, across the road there was there used to be a pub. So what's happened was all his clients and some of their gang, some of their entourage, would come into the pub and they're they're asking them that like, has he got a, has he got a garage? They know he's he lives upstairs. <laughs> has he got a garage? Has he got this? Has he got that? Someone in the pub has phoned him up and said, look, there's a load of pikeys down here. And they 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 want to know everything about rare rare rare. They're asking a lot of questions. He's phoned me up. I had half of the thing. I had a, we had a wolf. He had a wolf of PPK, a seven shot automatic. Um, he had the he had the clip. I had the the thing. So I've, he's phoned me up and said, "Come up with the thing." I've gone up there. I've gone up there. We found out one of them was the manager from the club who I've gone to do for two weeks before. And I didn't take this thing off. Found out he was one of the guys who was asking questions in the pub. So I've gone down. I've, I'm smoking a hell of a lot of crack. And I'm like, this guy's going to get it now. He's going to get to, I'm going to do this fella some damage. Be honest, I'm going to do some shit up. I might, you know, I'm most probably be coming home from now. He was going, he was going. So I've come downstairs, I'm with a friend and we've gone to the car, but... As I've come downstairs, I've been surrounded by some of these people, my, my governor's clients, and I know one of them. I know one of them well. Young guy, very sensible, sensible kid. I've gone over to him, shook his hand. All right, mate, how you doing? I've got one here. One on t- I'm talking to this guy who I know. Uh, we call him. We call him Bill. Billy Brown. We call him Billy Brown. So I'm talking to Billy Brown and. Uh, Gone, yeah, yeah, what's happening, mate? Rare, rare, rare. He's gone, oh, look, we just want to have a word with you about, about your governor, rare, rare, rare. So I've gone, look, what's, what's the problem? There's, there was another one in front of me with his hand behind his back. And he's like, look, we just want to have, look, we just want to have a little word with governor, rare, rare, rare. But he's standing there with his hand behind his back. I know he's got something. Another one's across the road and I've got another guy here. Anyway, we've ended up getting into I've told him about this guy who's to my right-hand side. I don't know him. He's standing there with both his hands in his in his puffer jacket, just looking at me like I've just fucked his mum or something. So I'm getting the ump with him. I'm talking to my, I'm saying, Bill, tell your friend to to move. You know what I mean? I've lifted up my top and shown him the the wolf up. The geezer, the manager from the club, is hiding behind the fucking behind the the Land Rover they got parked up down the road. Yeah, it's only a replica. So I said, yeah. Pulled out the thing, as I pulled out the thing, the safety come off and I put two in the fella, eh? in the chest. He had a bulletproof vest on, so one saved him in the chest and the other one took, got him in the shoulder. That was it. There was no headshot, there was no cocaine. You know, there was no one getting shot in the face. It was, it was a misunderstanding. This geezer here, and he, he was tooled up. I found out later on he was tooled and he, you know, he didn't put, I don't know why he didn't pull the thing and, and return. But anyway. This fella got two. That was it. I emptied out the rest of it on the rest of them running down the road. You know, whistling past heads and nearly taking off kneecaps and shit like that. Anyway, nearly went proper pear shape. You know, they're calling it on. They want to meet. They, they're tall. They're down the road. They, they've got all, they're tooled up fully to the nine. They're ready to go. Didn't come to it. In the end, about a week or two later, my governor got the got the paperwork and he proved to them that custom and excise had took their parcel. They took it on the chin. We all moved on, <laughs> you know, and that was the end of it. And to this day, I'm really good. I'm still good pals with the uh, with Billy. I'm still good pals with him, you know. It's just one of them misunderstandings that could have gone could have got a lot worse. But yeah, that's the lifestyle that we- that was the lifestyle yeah. I was in. I was smoking crack. Selling crap, that was my life. I was walking around with things, you know, it was insane. It's an insane way to live. It's not a way you'd want anyone to live because it, it being in that life and being a drug dealer, or class A drugs, it's a very, very dangerous game. The people you deal with, they're crazy. 
You know, the people you're dealing with, they're crazy. The, you got to look out for the old bill. You got to look out for these. Some, some of these customers are fucking just as insane. You know, it's not a good look. But it, but at the end of it, you know, you, you, you've changed your, your life and you've you've moved on from all that now, haven't you? But that was like thirty. That was what twenty five years ago. That yeah. that incident. You're a big advocate of autism as well, aren't you? Because you've got a, two boys. I've got two boys who are autistic, and yeah, you know. Um, I, it's a great cause. It's a great cause. Anything that I can do to to highlight the autism and and uh, you know the people that are, are living with it, the parents, um, you know, I salute these people because it is such hard work. People yeah. don't see how much hard work it is, and you know, and the, and the different different spectrums they're on yeah. with the autistic. You know, the, you you got people like Albert Einstein who was. Asperger's. One of my sons is Asperger's. You know, very, very clever, but socially awkward. You, you, you know, doesn't want to interact. No, no. doesn't. Well, not hard to make eye contact. You Struggles. know, but so smart, yeah. so clever. I mean, fucking put me to shame. The the level with the, this boy is on. And then I've got a younger one who is severely autistic, and he's hardly making sentences. You know. Um, and like yeah. I said to you yesterday, the best thing to do is to just be there, you know, on a support and roll. I've always felt that. Definitely, definitely. Yeah. I've well, always wanted to be do, there. Do you know what, Mark, right, I've really enjoyed this year. You've, you've lived a whirlwind life. It's been really traumatic. You know, you've had your ups and downs, you've, uh, and you've come through a lot of uh, chaos, you know, and the lifestyle and the consequences. And, and now, you know, you, you know you're know, you working in movies and, and, you, and you're doing stunts and, you know, what would you see? We come to the end of the podcast, and I always look for pearls of wisdom. Right? What would you say to a young Mark Epstein coming through the doors of life? Yeah, I would. I would say to a young me, you know, channel, channel that. Ne- you're angry. I can see you're angry. You can see you've got an attitude. You've got a chip on your bag of chips on your shoulder. Do something with that negative energy. Turn that negative into a positive in some way. And. MMA did that for me, and so the stunts do that for me. It's a way that I can channel, you know, my negative into into a positive. And um, yeah, it's it's like if I could direct one child who's going through, you know, rejection, low self worth, and and you know, feelings of um, hate, you know, and anger. It, it's, is channel that, channel it in it, try and channel that negative into a positive. You know, I think one of the one of the regrets of my life, I can say a regret, two regrets I can say I, I think I have. One that I didn't box, I would have loved to have boxed. You know, I wish I had him when I was playing football. I wish I'd boxed for Lawrence boys as well. And maybe a military life. There are two things that I think I would have excelled in. You know, if I'd have made it, if I'd have made it through the military, I think I would have excelled in that. And I think I would have excelled with boxing. And it's just a way of channeling that negative energy that I had, that anger, you know, that I had through my stepfather, through the abandonment, through the low self-worth, through the rejection. It would have been that. It would have been just channel your negative energy into something positive and, you know, whether it's fighting, boxing, combat sports, stunt work, you know, just channel it, just find an outlet. It's this, this, this not going to send you to prison and it's going to earn you money. What I'll do is I'll put all your description and if anyone wants to ask you any questions, then they can, they can find you on Instagram and, and stuff like that. So with that, thanks. I don't do too, too much social media. Yeah. I'm not really a fan of it anymore, I've, you know, because of the people that are associated with the who own the platforms? Yeah, <laughs> I'm just not. Um, I'm not feeling it. So yeah, that's the only. Thing, that's the only social. Media. Twitter and Instagram. Brilliant. Thank, Thank you, you so much, man. Thank you very much. Appreciate it. You're a legend, Bill. Thank legend. You.